So what's the deal with this protein powder? It seems like everywhere you turn, people are talking about this protein powder. You should get this protein powder or do this supplement or take this and all of a sudden you'll get all these muscles. Coaches are selling it. People on TV are selling it. What's the deal? In this podcast, we're going to talk about protein and maybe we might come up with an answer for what's the big deal about this protein powder. Let's get started. So in the last video, we mentioned some of the major macromolecules. So we talked about the idea that there were four major macromolecules, lipids, carbs, proteins, and nucleic acids. The last video, we looked at lipids and carbohydrates. In this video, we really want to focus on proteins and nucleic acids. So what are proteins? What are they comprised or composed of? So in proteins, we'll find the typical ones, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that we see in everything. But we're now going to introduce another atom that we'll see in proteins, and that is nitrogen. And we'll see this in the amino group, as you'll see in a moment. So what is a protein? Basically, it's just a long strain of these amino acids, right? So you've got your carbons, your hydrogens, your oxygen, and then there, of course, is the new nitrogen. This R group we'll talk about more in a minute, but it changes. So what is a protein? It's just these groupings of polypeptides arranged in a 3D manner. What do they do? So proteins provide structure, right? When you think of your muscle structure, um, proteins are a big component of that. Proteins are also enzymes. And we haven't spoken about enzymes much this year, but we'll get into enzymes later. These are essentially something that help reactions take place. Those happen to be proteins. Proteins are often involved also in signaling, cellular signaling. How do cells communicate or different molecules communicate within our bodies? So we have structure, enzymes, signaling. Here's an example of a particular enzyme when a substrate fits in it, this helps a reaction occur, chemical reactions. So you can see proteins are pretty diverse, right? And these are some of the three main ones. There's actually many more functions. Proteins are diverse in their function. Well, what are they made of? Proteins monomers, their basic unit, are amino acids. And as you can see up here, the amino acids are basically just grouped together to make a polypeptide chain or protein. So let me give you some examples. Um, here's one example, actin, right? We've been talking about protein powder and muscles. Actin and myosin are some of the proteins we find in muscle. So here's one hint. Sometimes proteins will end in IN, just like protein ends in IN. So actin is a protein in the muscle. Lactase is an enzyme that helps to break down lactose. Notice that enzymes end in ASE, okay? So we've got actin, that's just a normal protein. Lactase, a particular protein, an enzyme. Um, and then I wanted to give you another one, hemoglobin. Also notice the IN, it ends there. Uh, this, of course, is what transports oxygen in your blood cells and your red blood cells, okay? So proteins, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, many functions, including structure and enzymes, made up of amino acids, and several examples listed for you below. So speaking of amino acids, let's get in a little deeper. The structure of amino acid, they all have the basic same structure, but there's a different R group, which we'll see. All right, so what do they look like? There's always a central carbon central carbon, hydrogen attached. Then an amino group will be attached to one side. There it is, this is an amino group, an NH2. The other side will have a carboxyl group. This is an acidic, some people call it a carboxylic acid. So this basic structure is in all amino acids. Central carbon, amino group, carboxylic acid group. What changes and what makes different amino acids is this R group right here, okay? R group can be many different things. In fact, we know of 
roughly 20 amino acids because they have different R groups. So this is the side change that makes each amino acid different and unique. So how then do amino acids group together? So if you take this amino acid, add another amino acid, essentially you're just going to make a polypeptide chain. So what you can see here is here's an amino acid and here's an amino acid and here's an amino acid, right? They group together to make polypeptides. So where do we get this name polypeptide? Well, it actually comes from the bond. The bonds in between each amino acid are peptide bonds. And so what you see here is when you have a bunch of amino acids grouped together, forming peptide bonds between the amino group and the carboxylic acid group, that's where we get the amino, right? These are formed by dehydration synthesis. So you can see that we're gonna lose an H and an OH in the form of water, then these will come together and bond forming peptide bonds. So when you put a bunch of them together, we get a polypeptide chain. These group together to form, of course, proteins, okay? So that's the basic structure of an amino acid. Now, what about those R groups? Well, it's those R groups on the amino acid that give us the variation we see in proteins. So the chemical properties and interactions of these R groups on the amino acids determine the structure and function for the protein, right? And we just talked about the idea that there are several different functions of protein. Some are enzymes, some act in muscle, some act in signaling, right? So how do we get such variation in proteins? Well, we get it because we have different amino acids with different R groups. And because those R groups have different structure, they ultimately end up giving different function. So here's a few examples. So here's two amino acids, phenylalanine, tryptophan. These amino acids happen to be hydrophobic because of their R group. All right, so let's look a little deeper. So we have, if you look really carefully, right, you've got the amino group, we've got our central carbon, we've got our carboxyl group over to the side, then this right here would be the R group. This particular R group isn't that special, right? It's just a little bit, looks like a little benzene ring. So this happens to be nonpolar, right? No, no atoms that really make it polar, and thus it would be hydrophobic. So these two are an example of two amino acids that are hydrophobic. Let's look at some that are hydrophilic, meaning these are polar. So same thing, right? You've got your central carbon, you've got your amino group, your carboxylic acid group then this is the R group. Same thing down here. This is the R group. And if you look at these particular things, here you've got a sulfur, here you've got an oxygen out here. These happen to make a polar molecule, which will have different properties, thus making it hydrophilic in these two examples. Okay? So some amino acids are hydrophobic, nonpolar. Some amino acids are hydrophilic, polar. Then we actually have some that have a charge. And so in this case, notice aspartic acid and glutamic acid. You're hearing, you, if you notice, oh, both acids, these happen to have negative overall charges, right? So if you look at your central carbon, you've got your amino group, you've got your carboxylic acid group, and then you've got this variable R group, this particular group happens to give off a negative charge and means it's acidic. We have others, right, which give a positive charge, meaning they're kind of basic in this case. So this R group and this R group here give off a positive overall positive charge, meaning they're basic. So it's these R groups, right, that really set up the properties of these amino acids. And since the amino acids make up the proteins, it's really these R groups that make up the overall properties of different proteins. All right, so let's talk about levels of structure in proteins, okay? Up to this point, we've told you, well, okay, proteins are basically just 
amino acids grouped together, right? Here's an amino acid, and there's an amino acid, and there. So they're essentially just a chain of amino acids. We call this the primary structure. The primary structure, and sometimes you'll see it just like that, a one, primary degree, is the order of amino acids in the chain, right? You've got this one followed by this. So you've got tryptophan, by aspartic acid, by glutamate, like just the order of the amino acids determines its primary structure. And what determines the structure of your amino acids, of course, it all goes originally back to the DNA. So primary structure, just the order of amino acids. Now, as we know, these amino acids have different R groups. Now, what if you had one here that's positive and one here that's negative? Oh, positive and negative might attract to each other. You might also have some that form hydrogen bonds because of their polarity with each other. That will set up what we call the secondary structure. So this is when the chain, the first structure, starts to fold. And we see, we see several structures form. There are two that we see often, the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. These, as you'll see, form little hydrogen bonds in between them. You can see these little hydrogen bonds and that makes it fold. So we talk a lot about proteins folding, right? Your protein is a three-dimensional folded structure. Well, what causes the folds? It's actually the interactions of these R groups, right? The R groups in these amino acids interact with each other. Some are positive, some are negative, some are hydrophobic, some are hydrophilic, and they start forming these structures. So secondary, forms these local folding. And these are two common ones, alpha helix, right? It sort of forms this helical pattern. And then these we call a beta pleated sheet. It just looks like it's forming some sheets. The tertiary structure actually then forms because of these hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions with the R groups. And you'll see within the tertiary, you're still gonna have the secondary, right? So the tertiary, here's an important thing to remember, the tertiary includes the secondary and primary structure, but it's the level beyond those. So if you think about here, this protein is folded. It's got some stuff on the inside. It's got some amino acids on the inside. It's got some amino acids on the outside. Because of the hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties of some of these amino acids, the ones on the inside are gonna be hydrophobic. The ones out here maybe on the outside would be hydrophilic. They're okay with the water. So this is another level. They fold here in secondary based on these hydrogen bonds, but in the tertiary structure, they start to fold based on hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions. The uh, hydrophobic ones want to get in the center, whereas the hydrophilic ones can be okay being out. All right, then finally, the quaternary structure is when several of these subunits come together, right? Several polypeptides come together to form the quaternary structure, multiple polypeptides. So this is kind of a tricky idea. The important thing to remember is that the quaternary includes all the other structures, right? Um, the primary structure is just the order, but then when the folds start, we get all the way up to quaternary structure. Okay, so we talked proteins. Now let's talk about the last major macromolecule, nucleic acids. So nucleic acids have the typical ones, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. They also have nitrogen and phosphorus. So we're gonna see the addition of these two atoms in our nucleic acids. Well, what's the function of nucleic acids? information storage and heredity. You can see right here, right, we're looking at some DNA. And you know DNA is all about information storage. Um, something which, you know, a lot of people just tend to not think about or neglect is why do we call these nucleic acids? Well, it's because DNA, RNA, and eukaryotes are found in the nucleus, right? So when we first discovered these, right, they were acids in the nucleus, let's call them nucleic acids. The name stuck. What are nucleic acids made of? Nucleotides, 
So if we look at the basic unit of a nucleotide, we'll see the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then we'll also see the nitrogen in the ring and the phosphate here. I'm going to go into this in more detail in the next slide. So what are our examples of nucleic acids? Of course, DNA and RNA. Notice the double-stranded DNA and the single-stranded RNA, which is typical in organisms. All right, so let's really get a little closer look here into DNA. So think about your chromosomes, right? Chromosomes are just condensely packed DNA round, wound around histone proteins. So if we sort of unpack it, right, take the chromosome and, and look deeply into it, really you're just looking at some DNA. Well, then we take the DNA and really get a good look at it. What are we looking at? We're looking at a backbone of DNA, which is sugars and phosphates. In the center of the DNA, these things in the center, are our nitrogenous bases, of which there are four, A, T, C, and G. Now, I have an entire video on DNA where we'll go into the details of this, but for now, just understand those are the nitrogenous bases. So, let's look a little deeper. All right, so here's some DNA. Remember, we've got the sugar phosphate backbone. That's over here, sugar and phosphates. Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. In the center, of course, are the nitrogenous bases. So let's take one of these units. I think I've got a fancy thing there. Oh, yeah. Nitro and what we'll do is we'll take one of those nucleotides and really look a little deeper. So here is a nucleotide. It has three parts. A nucleotide has a sugar, a phosphate, and some nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base is a carbon and a nitrogen ring, and there are four types in DNA, A, T, C, and G, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. We'll learn about those more in detail later. And then in RNA, you'll see there's uracil, a different base, okay? So there's the base. Those are in the center of the DNA. Then as we move out, we hit the sugar, and this happens to be a pentose sugar. One, two, three, four, five carbons, pentose sugar. In RNA, that is a ribose sugar. In DNA, it's a deoxyribose, meaning it's missing one of the oxygens that the ribose sugar had. And then finally, we've got that phosphate group there. So this is a nucleotide. Here are the three parts, nitrogen base, pentose sugar, phosphate group. These, of course, form a sequence in your DNA. So let's look a little deeper at RNA and DNA and start to wrap things up here. So RNA, as I mentioned, is a single chain, and it has uracil as a base instead of thymine, right? So instead of C, G, A, and T, like we see in DNA, we have C, G, A, and U. But we, all, but we still have the phosphate, the pentose sugar, all the way down. Now, as I've mentioned before, RNA and DNA have a direction, and it's all about what carbon is exposed at the end. So up on this end, if we're looking at RNA, we got a phosphate group. That is attached to the fifth carbon. So if we're counting from here, one, two, three, four, five carbon, this is the five prime end. What's the one down here that's exposed? Oh, it's the hydroxyl group that's exposed, and that's on the one, two, third carbon from the center. So this is the three prime carbon. Now, RNA is this single strand, but it does have a direction. Now, that, of course, can move up and down, but there is a direction. There's a three prime end and a five prime end. DNA also has direction, but because there's two strands, one strand will go from the five to three, while the other strand goes from the three to the five. So let's look a little more in detail at DNA. DNA is a double nucleotide chain. So here's one chain, there's the second chain, right? One, two, double helix. Also notice there's no uracil, there's no use. DNA has T's, thymine as the nitrogenous base. Another really interesting point is that in DNA, these bonds are hydrogen bonds. They're weak bonds that hold that double helix together. 
So let's do a little bit of summary. Think about all the macromolecules we've talked about in the last podcast and in this one. Carbohydrates, think back. Carbohydrates include these big polysaccharides, which are made up of like a disaccharide, which are essentially made up of mono, right? Monosaccharides, one sugar, disaccharides, two sugars, polysaccharides, three or more, many, many sugars. So that's carbs. And when we think carbs, we think carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Then we've got, we talked about lipids. Lipids include triglycerides and, right, you see the three triglycerides, and phospholipids, the phosphate head and the fatty acid chains, and steroids fall in this class too. Notice these don't polymerize, right? It's not like these, which this makes up this, which makes up this. These are all separate because lipids don't polymerize. Also remember that lipids contain high carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, except for this phospholipid, which includes a phosphorus as well. Then proteins, we talked about them today. Proteins are made up of polypeptides, which consist of amino acids. So several amino acids together make up these polypeptides. The polypeptides together make up the proteins. Now let's remember those, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But also notice that we had the amino group, so we had the nitrogen as well. Then nucleic acids. Nucleic acids include DNA and RNA and are made up of nucleotides, a nitrogenous base, a ribose pentose sugar, and RNA, and a phosphate group. Nucleic acids, remember, have the typical carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but also the nitrogen from the nitrogenous base and the phosphorus from the phosphate group. This is a great slide to sort of commit to your memory. This is important. It's a, it shows all of the different macromolecules uh, in a pretty nice summary, I like to think. Okay, so let's end. What's the deal with this protein powder? Well, we just said protein, right, made up of amino acids. So you might see these protein powders say, have all, have all the essential amino acids, right? Why do we care? Well, we just talked about the fact that protein made up of amino acids is what makes up a lot of your protein in your body, including those muscle fibers like actin and myosin. So should we all just go out and buy lots of protein powder if we wanna get big muscles? Well, it's, it's actually not that simple. One of the things I want you to consider is when you're having a discussion with your healthcare provider about whether protein powder is, is, is good for you or not good for you, there have been several studies, this one I pulled from Harvard Health, that say there are some hidden dangers of protein powders. A lot of them had, have added sugar calories and even some really toxic metals and chemicals that we found in a lot of these protein powders. Protein powders in general are not rec regulated by the FDA, which is why you can walk in just about any store and just buy them because they're supposed to be inert enough that they don't really have an effect or impact. But as some of these studies have shown, there are some hidden dangers in some of these protein powders. So I'm not gonna give you advice either way. What I will say is, if this is something that you and your healthcare provider feel is important for you, make sure you're doing your research and finding out if these brands you're looking into have any of these hidden dangers in their protein powders.